LBJ said, silver has become too valuable to use as money, which most of us thought money was supposed to be valuable. <laughs> Everywhere I go, I tell people, don't save dollars, buy as much silver as you can. And gentlemen, if you were to just be a chartist and look at the chart on silver, where it's been, and compare it to everything else and the whole commodity market, and didn't know that it was silver, you would say, well, whatever that is, because it is so cheap relative to where it's been in the last 45 years or so, I want whatever that is. Because if it's in high demand, industrial demand, investment demand, I want some of it. Beginning in the early 1970s, Hunt and his brothers, William Herbert and Lamar, initiated the accumulation of vast quantities of silver on Comex through Brodsky and Associates, nearly cornering the global market by 1979. Their estimated silver holdings of 100 million troy ounces generated a staggering $2 to $4 billion in profits from silver speculation during the final nine months of 1979 alone. This monumental accumulation significantly impacted silver futures and bullion prices, escalating from $11 an ounce in September 1979 to an astounding $50 an ounce by January 1980. However, this rapid ascent was short-lived as silver prices swiftly plummeted to below $11 an ounce within two months, notably on the notorious Silver Thursday. Subsequently, in February 1985, according to the United States Commodity Futures Trading Commission, the Hunt brothers faced charges of manipulating silver prices during this period. Jim Clark revisits this historic period, highlighting the astronomical surge in silver prices as a pivotal moment. Amidst the chaotic economic landscape of the late 70s, characterized by soaring inflation, escalating interest rates, and a weakening dollar, silver emerged as a refuge for wealth preservation. The remarkable rise in silver's value, skyrocketing from $6 or $7 to an unprecedented $50 an ounce within a year, garnered significant attention. Jim, assessing the situation from a chartist's perspective, recognized the remarkable demand and undervaluation inherent in the silver market. However, amidst this meteoric rise, a sinister series of events unfolded. The exchanges modified their regulations, allowing only selling and restricting buying, effectively trapping the hunts and preventing them from liquidating their silver holdings. Matters exacerbated as the Federal Reserve intervened, forbidding loans against precious metals, further cornering the hunts. Reflecting on this tumultuous period, a well-known analyst, Charles Goyette, underscores a pivotal lesson the prevalence of counterparty risk in any. He accentuates the contrast between tangible intrinsic value in real assets such as physical gold and silver and the inherent uncertainties in other assets lacking such substantial worth. We will present Jim Clark and Charles Goyette clips with the Rich Dad channel. But before we do, if you want more videos like this, please hit the subscribe button and turn on the notification bell for more updates. Thank you and enjoy the video. I wouldn't say that they were manipulating the price in that sense. Now, I don't know what was going on in their mind. Uh, Bunker and Herbert Hunt, who are the brothers of Lamar Hunt, uh, and the son, all of them are sons of H.L. Hunt, the oil tycoon. But, yeah, Texas oil people, uh, they called Bunker Hunt the, uh, uh, the J.R. Ewing of oil in Texas. But they had the idea that the value of the dollar was going to collapse, as we've seen even more since then, and they wanted to protect their money with silver. Oh, and, so they, they weren't crooks. They were just defensive guys. They had about a $4 billion net worth is what we could estimate at the time, and they were buying up as much silver around the world as they could to protect their dollars. Remember, we were heading for 20% interest uh, or 20, yeah, 20 percent interest rates at the time. The dollar was falling. Inflation was out of control, uh, just about to the same level that we have right now. And they said, how do we protect our money? And they said, silver's got to be the way. And they were just kind of mumbling around through the markets and buying futures contracts and taking delivery and the warehouses in New York where it was running out of silver. <coughs> the price went from basically around six, seven dollars an ounce in mid 79 to $50 an ounce in January of 1980. If you were to just be a chartist and look at the chart on silver where it's been and compare it to everything else and the whole commodity market and didn't know that it was silver, you would say, well, whatever that is, because it is so cheap relative to where it's been in the last 45 years or so, I want whatever that is. Because if it's in high demand, industrial demand, investment demand, I want some of it. Some I remember you telling me a few weeks ago, Robert, that the next move for silver is to $68 an ounce. And I've quoted that before 
And people, ah, that can't be so. I said, listen, when somebody says that, you might ask the question, if they're so damn smart, why ain't they rich? I said, well, it was a billionaire that told me that quote. So <laughs> I, I think he's pretty damn smart. So this, think about this. March 1979, silver's, I don't know, 6 or $7 an ounce. Bunker Hunt comes to Phoenix to an event that we put on. That You're we were kidding involved me. With. He came to Phoenix, private event, and he said uh, – he said, um, I'm, he said, I'm Texas accent. He goes, I can't do one, but I'll try. He goes, I'm going to tell you what I think. He said, I think, you know, silver could go to 15 and people in the audience, there's four or 500 people there. They go, Ooh, oh. and he goes, he looks at him. He said, well, I let me tell well, let me tell you, I think silver could go to 30 and they go, Ooh, ah, even louder, you know? Ooh, ah. And then he said, you know, we're all friends here. You all understand what the government's doing. Um, let me tell you where I really think silver is going. He said, I think silver is probably going to top out. I think silver is going to go to $50 an ounce. That stuck in my head. I remember it as clear today as the day he said it. And nine months later, where was silver? $50 an ounce. And, to, and it would have stayed there had they not stolen it all. The exchanges had stolen all the silver from them that, uh, at that time. So think about that. This is an exchange where people come to buy and sell stuff on an even basis. And the exchange changed the rules of the game that you could only sell and nobody could buy. So nobody could buy any more silver. The hunts couldn't liquidate any silver. All they had to, all they would let them do was sell what they had. And it got even worse because the deep state stepped in and the federal reserve even stepped in in conjunction with the exchange, the cronies in the exchanges that were robbing the hunts, the Federal Reserve stepped in and they said, and by the way, we're going to redline, means prohibit, all loans, all bank loans on gold and silver so that it could stick it to the hunts a little more so they couldn't even borrow against the silver and gold that they owned. They couldn't even borrow it. That was the deep state working on behalf of the insiders, the cronies at the exchanges that were being killed by being on the wrong side of the silver market when Bucker Hunt was right. right. Where was their exposure? Their exposure was that they were trusting counterparties, you know, that they had right. money in the exchanges, they had title to gold or silver, they had uh, title to silver companies, they had, uh, they had commodities contracts and stuff. But the lesson that you've taught over and over is you everything has a counterparty risk. It depends on somebody else's promise, their performance, their honesty, and so on, unless it's real gold and real silver that you hold in your hands and not somebody else's promise to pay you down the road. The U.S. Department of the Treasury announced that the United States national debt has surged past a historic milestone, exceeding $33 trillion for the first time. This monumental level was reached less than two weeks before a looming potential government shutdown due to a lack of funding authorization. In light of this staggering national debt, Jim underscores that in 1976, when the national debt was nearing $1 trillion, it triggered significant alarm. However, within a remarkably short period, the debt skyrocketed to $33 trillion, with the Biden administration adding another trillion in just three months. Jim is struck by the rapid escalation, pointing out that it took the nation 200 years to reach the initial trillion, while the current administration managed to amass one in a fraction of that time. Expressing similar concerns, Charles Goyette also highlights the sustainability challenges posed by this colossal debt, especially amid historic inflationary trends. Despite notable downgrades of U.S. government debt by certain establishment figures and credit rating agencies, Jim observes a sense of unawareness or indifference among many Americans regarding the gravity of the situation. Let's get back to the interview. All the entitlements that are out there are far more than the national debt that we have. Correct. Correct. So it's, it's, it's even bigger than when we hear the national debt just hit $33 trillion. Well, it's maybe more like $200 trillion Correct. is the real number. Well, I can remember in 1976 when the national debt was approaching a trillion dollars and everybody was up in arms saying, well, we can't, we can't stand a trillion dollar national debt that the country will go down the drain. And fast forward a few more years and uh, to 33 trillion and just in three months in the Biden administration, they added over 1 trillion to the national debt. So it took us in 200. A few months. Yeah, in three months, it took us 200 years to get to the first trillion. Biden was able to add another trillion to the 33 that we have now in three months. You know, they told the rest of the world at that time, 
you, you used to hold gold in your reserves and issue your own currencies against gold. Gold's passe. So from now on, you just hold U.S. dollars. You hold these U.S. dollars, issue your currency against these U.S. dollars. And it didn't take long for people to suddenly start realizing that the United States is printing a lot more dollars than they have gold to back it up with. Yeah, and that should have been the tipping point for all of us if we didn't already see it in 1933 when Roosevelt confiscated the gold from right. the American people, but foreigners could own it. We couldn't exchange our paper dollars for gold. In fact, if you had gold, you had to turn it in. And if you didn't, you could have been fined up to $10,000 or imprisoned like, for six months. They Well, they can't collect enough taxes for it to happen. They can't... Uh, Print it fast enough, the, the value of the dollar will just nosedive. It's already going way down. Uh, we're at historic inflation numbers right now. So they're in a catch-22 situation. How can you sustain that kind of a debt, pay the interest on it without running the country into the ground? And Robert, as you know, even like some of the establishment guys are starting to scratch their head and look at this. And he, So Moody's downgraded U.S. government debt just last week. Fitch's has downgraded it. Uh, it's been, been downgraded since 2011. But the American people hear that news and they don't know what it means. They don't think that, that, that there's anything wrong with the U.S. As the Hunt brothers navigated a meteoric rise followed by a dramatic crash, they unveiled vulnerabilities within financial systems and the pitfalls of relying on intangible assets. It underscores the lasting value and resilience of physical gold and silver during economic turbulence, showcasing their stability. Investors will likely persist in seeking refuge in these tangible assets for their stability during market turmoil. What are our thoughts on the interview? Share your observations in the comments section below. Also, ensure you like this video, subscribe to the channel, and turn on post notifications for more videos like this. Thanks for watching.